Hi, River. Thank you so much for joining me, friend. Hey, thanks for having me. So um, I would love to start as usual by just hearing about your background and your story and kind of how you got to where you are today. Yeah, so the main salient early point is that I grew up very, very fundamentalist Christian. The whole, like I didn't speak to anyone who wasn't a young earth creationist until I was probably 17 or 18, I think. Like I just wasn't allowed out of those circles in any way. And yeah, my schools were all very small. My elementary school was like 14 people in a trailer behind the church. So it was all that type of thing. <laughs> and somewhere around 14 or 15, I was in a pastor training high school. And I started to realize from all of the doctrine classes and bi- rereading the Bible that I couldn't actually believe in any of the stuff. Like, no matter how hard I tried, like, I kept having questions. And I really earnestly wanted to believe because it didn't seem like there was an option to not believe. Like, everyone believed it. It's how the world must be. I'm just not understanding something here. And then when I asked questions, I just kept getting screamed at, beaten, punished, thrown into counseling, all these different things. So I eventually just kind of learned to shut up about it and pretend through the last few years of high school there which yeah built up a huge amount of resentment towards religion in general christianity in particular and i went kind of swung the other way as one is wont to do from an evangelical upbringing and went very like new atheist materialist we're all just dead specks on a cold dead rock in space, that whole thing, which predictably enough made me miserable. So (laughs) I spent the next couple years, you know, unable to talk to any of my friends in any meaningful ways, unable to interact with my family, not able to like talk to anyone about the fact that I felt completely hopeless and alone in the universe, which led a lot of dark places for a few years there and finally got bad enough Yeah, I've talked about from here on on Twitter a lot before, but I'll just repeat some stuff. Um, Yeah, the worst point was when I got to Korea the first year there. And my idea had kind of been, like, this will be a new start. It'll be fresh. I'm somewhere new with new people. It'll be great. And then I got stationed, like, on the outskirts of town in the countryside with no other foreigners for, like, a 40-minute bus ride around me. And I got to my apartment after realizing this and just kind of stared out the window for a bit and started slowly realizing that there was a better than 50% chance that I wouldn't be alive one year from then. And yeah, I just broke down crying for the rest of that day, basically. And after that, like consciously, I didn't change much of anything. I just felt really, really shitty about it. But looking back on it, I can see, like, I was starting to kind of subconsciously feel around for a way out. And how that eventually manifested was that I'd been reading a lot of, like, Sumerian mythology around that time. And, like, the Epic of Gilgamesh is one of my favorite books still. And I'd reread a couple translations of that and a few of the surrounding myths. And somewhere in the middle of that, I started, like, toying with the idea that the sun and the moon are the two eyes of the sky god Anu. Like each one is watching over me and turns throughout the day. And like his, the sun, his daytime eyes like felt very energizing to me. And then the moonlight one felt very, yeah, refreshing and relaxing, soothing, I guess would be the word there. And it took me a while to, like, I was so out of it at that point that it took me a while to realize I was even doing that. (laughs) And by the time I did notice, like, my conscious mind was very angry at me. So it's like, that's irrational religious bullshit. Stop that. Is it okay to swear? (laughs) Okay. Uh, But yeah, like, my rational mind was pretty angry at me. 
but I had already been going for like a week like this without super noticing. And it had just become too clear that it was working and that I felt so much better during that week. So I kept doing it. And that was kind of my first entryway into what I would now think of as like chaos magic, which is where I went next, which yeah, is essentially just like find the beliefs and rituals and practices that work with you that kind of fit into your system and make you feel good or make you feel whatever it is you need to feel. And yeah, I somehow ran across some chaos magic books right after that, which were exactly what I needed at that point, luckily. (laughs) And yeah, the rest of my time in Korea was kind of a mixture of chaos magic, meditation, and I started getting into tarot at that point. I'm just shuffling my tarot cards off screen here. (laughs) And yeah, tarot has been the main thing that has stayed with me like from the beginning. I got into it right there, and now I still just kind of handle and check my cards while I'm doing things. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so after that, I had more like of a yoga phase for like a year went to a studio in korea with i guess the leader had like studied with osho for like 10 years 20 years before i was there which explained a lot once i like later knew who osho was and all the stuff around him i was like oh that's why that place was really uncomfortable for me a lot of the time (laughs) So I learned a lot of stuff there. It was generally positive experience, but one of the main things they taught me was like having some self-respect and boundaries and like knowledge of what is and is not for me because they were constantly violating my boundaries and pushing back on me to do things that I was not comfortable with. So yeah, good and bad, but in the end, excellent learning experience. (laughs) But I stayed away from yoga after that for a long time until about two weeks ago, I started checking out Rosalind's site that she's got and that's sitting much more nicely now. But yeah, that made me pretty allergic to (laughs) yoga for a long time there. And yeah, after that, everything gets really eclectic. I kind of went through like Vajrayana phases, back to chaos magic phase, back to like more traditional hermetic magic, and then back to Vajrayana, just kind of skipping through things and picking up a lot of stuff. And it has recently started to coalesce after, yeah, after our Berbea group, basically, once we, our Sangha has been really helpful to me in just kind of accepting certain things about what my practice is and isn't, what my views are and aren't. And yeah, Robert Bay is just great. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, he just gave a lot of permission for things to no longer be so allergic to like entire traditions just because uh, several parts of them don't really fit with me. And to no longer, like, expect to find a particular tradition that is just going to fit like a glove and I'll be able to, you know, get off to the races with it. Yeah, if I go much further, I think I'm just going to be talking a lot about Rob Berbea. So (laughs) where I'm at right now is kind of, yeah, I've been able to find some permission for myself to put together the practice that I need, largely based kind of on a Jungian lens on magic and alchemy mixed with a lot of the Vajrayana influence, especially coming down through Reggie Ray. Hmm. It's fascinating how many of the influences there are on your spiritual practice. And um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I really ping ponged around a lot there. (laughs) (laughs) Totally. Um, And just to be clear to tease out one thing about like Mm -hmm. when you were, from your description of it now and from I think the thread you wrote about it a while ago when you were in Korea and you were like having this relationship to the sun and the moon it was kind of am I right in inferring or hearing that it was from this attitude of like 
oh, fuck it. Like, this isn't working. I'll just try anything. Maybe this will work kind of thing. Essentially. That is... That's where I ended up with it. At first, I think it was like... With the Sun and the Moon one specifically, I think it was just like soul desperation or something. Like, Because, yeah, I didn't realize that I was doing it, which sounds a little strange to me now, but like I was really out of it for a while there the school that i ended up like getting posted at to teach was just famously the one where they just chuck all of the shit kids basically the kids Mm -hmm. who just don't behave have issues so i was very isolated on the outskirts of town isolated in a lot of other ways because this was my first time like away from like my home and my family which i'd been isolated from for five years (laughs) And yeah, then at this point, I was like, pretty sure I was probably going to kill myself within a year. So I was very out of it and somehow started getting into this space of, yeah, the sun and the moon are the eyes of a god who cares about me and like energizes and soothes me. Hmm. And then after that, once I'd realized like, oh, that helped, like, I don't feel it feels much less certain that I'm going to kill myself if this continues feeling this way. And then once I started getting more into the chaos magic side of things, that was the attitude that appealed to me very much was just like, fuck it. You don't have to actually believe, believe in all these things. You just have to provisionally believe in the things that are helpful to you And then at a certain point of provisionally believing those things, it becomes very, very clear that, oh, a lot of this is just straight up true. Like, it's not a fantasy that I'm just kind of allowing myself to do for a couple hours a day. There's something here. There's something very real here. And it started switching over more towards, all right, let's engage with the sacred, I guess. But yeah, it started out very much as, yeah, fuck it. Anything that will keep me alive this year. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you say, I realize this could be a whole deep dive itself, but do you think you could say briefly how you mentioned in passing like chaos magic and hermetic magic and alchemy? Do you think you could say like briefly how those things relate and what they are? I could only really say how those relate to me. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of the things I really like about like magic and Western esoteric circles these days is the kind of hodgepodge nature of it. Every time I talk about, like, Buddhism on Twitter, I get, like, 20 people finding me on search and coming to my DMs to drop sutra quotes and, like, you're not exactly right on this, and this word actually translates like this. And But when it's magic, like, nothing is really super codified. Like, you can find it, especially in hermetic magic. Hermetic magic is the much more, like, structured, traditional... There's a right way to do this particular ritual, all of that. But in general, in like magic circles, it's kind of like, oh, you worship, I don't know, Thoth, who you also see as an aspect of Hecate. That's weird, but okay, cool. Like, I wouldn't have seen those two as aspects of each other, but run with it. (laughs) Um, But yeah, for me, I would have to... think on that a lot but for me i think it's mostly like time coded to my life the difference between those things like chaos magic i think of as very elementary like early stuff because for me it was the elementary early stuff it's very much pick what you want smorgasbord style and then after that i kicked more into hermetic which is again to me like the next stage of overly reliant on structure, like really too structured. But I've met people with, you know, a lot of hermetic background who are quite flexible and not pedantic about it. <laughs> but for me, it seems like over reliance on structure of particular spells, particular calls, particular like models of the world. And then alchemy to me is very much inflected with depth psychology and Carl Jung and all that stuff. So for me, those are the zones that I'm talking about when I talk about those. I see. Yeah, and let's dive into Jung and how did you get into Jung and everything that he's all about? Yeah. Um, Well, I first got into Jung 
via Joseph Campbell, because one of the teachers in my doctrine class at the teacher or at the pastor training school specifically called out Masks of Young by Joseph Campbell as like an evil thing from the devil that we need to make sure we stay away from <laughs> for its evil attitudes. I was like, all right, I'll go pick up a copy of that. <laughs> so like literally that day I was at the local Barnes and Noble definitely not shoplifting a copy paying for it legally and with money that I earned <laughs> and yeah got really into like I read the whole series of have you ever read Masks of God? No. Okay. Uh yeah, it's basically just like from quote unquote primitive mythology up through oriental mythology occidental mythology creative mythology so kind of just tracing a pattern of human engagement with the divine through like a very generalist attitude like it's not like in-depth super hardcore scholarship and i'm sure a lot of the archaeology by now is like just straight up wrong and misguided (laughs) but yeah at the time it was huge for me just to like see First of all, there's, like, other, to engage with another human who was not going to scream at me for asking, like, if the Earth is 6,000 years old, like, how come we can see stars that are further than 600 light, or 6,000 light years away? That doesn't seem to make sense, right? And, like, not getting sent to twice a week counseling for asking. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So engaging with these books where someone was like asking questions about God, about mythology, about divinity in a way that was not like dogmatic and locked down. That was huge, just enormous for me. And then I was at a secondhand bookshop at a certain point and there's a little anthology, The Portable Young, And at the bottom, like in even bigger letters than Young, is edited by Joseph Campbell. Mm -hmm. So I just saw Joseph Campbell's name on it and was like, all right, let's check out this Young guy, figure out who this is. And I didn't get super into him in high school. Like I read most of that anthology, really liked it. There were two or three essays that really stuck with me from that. But I didn't like become a young head immediately or anything. Jung is more something that I have dipped into again and again over the years, and probably probably about every three years since I was 16 or so, I've had, like, Jung phases where I'll read everything I can get my hands on and then just kind of pull away again for a couple years and then read everything I can get my hands on and pull away again. And yeah, more recently, it's been sticking quite a bit, but in a in a pretty particular way. Like, yeah, how do I want to say this one? The past few months, my interest in Jung has been very strong, but not like, not entirely for the sake of like, Jung in himself, Jung's ideas, Jung's stuff. He strikes me as an excellent example of a particular thing that I've been hungry for, which is like a person who engages the sacred and engages the unconscious kind of on their own terms, on in a very personal way that they figure out how to engage with it. Yeah, so he's one example, and there's a lot of other examples that I really like, like Philip K. Dick. And uh, I did my thesis in college on Henry Darger, who's like an incredibly fucked up version of that, but somewhat a version of that. (laughs) And William Blake, I keep meaning to read more of because I feel everything I've seen and heard from him very strongly gives me that vibe of just a person who found their own way to the divine and just kind of shrugged off all of the like strictures and shackles that were supposed to be guiding that relationship mediating that relationship and just kind of shrugged right past it and did his own thing but i keep like not doing a deep dive on william blake and i really need to (laughs) but yeah young you know i've reread the red the red book three or four times by this point and it just 
gets stranger and stranger. <laughs> and then his, yeah, I'm still at the moment getting further into like the Gnostic influences on Jung, which are very rich and dense. And that's kind of what's holding me at this point is the richness and density of Jung's engagement with whatever you'd call it, the sacred, the divine, the unconscious, anything. And I think he's a really good example because, you know, he wrote so much about it and like built up a lot of structure around it to explain himself to like an academic, to a world that is very much of the intellectual class while also in like his private writings showing much more ambivalence about the whole world of academia and intellectualizing this type of work. Like over and over again in the Red Book, he says things like, uh, have you not counted the murderers among the scholars? Mm. And like just that, you know, people are picking this stuff apart and killing it by trying to examine it. And over and over again, he says like, you know, we will draw these things out separate so that we can talk about them a bit. But in experience, they are all so fused together and intertwined and interwoven. There's no way to actually separate the idea of anima from the idea of archetype, from the idea of complex. Like, none of these are pull apartable. They're all one thing. But I'm going to act like they're separate things so that we can talk about it for a while. So I think he's like an excellent bridge for people who are much more like on the intellectual side of things to get them started on Jung's intellectual side and then like move over bit by bit to the more esoteric sides of his work and all the other stuff that is similar to his work. How would you describe what kinds of things he was interested in, broadly speaking? It's very broadly Mm -hmm. speaking um (laughs) i'm having a hard time like finding a place within that question to grip Mm -hmm. yeah so i'll just talk lightly about his career trajectory real quick which was like You know, he was a medical student first and foremost, then like chose to focus within medicine of the mind, psychiatry. And he was like Freud's star pupil for quite a while. But even, I think even in university, he was like studying seances and stuff like that. And as a young child, there was a lot of experience of having two personalities, like two people inside of him. Uh, He called them personality one and personality two, which would later kind of map onto the spirit of the times, like who I am right now, this person, and then spirit of the depths, which is kind of the, yeah, the undertow, the undercurrent, the undermind, or the oversoul. Under and over get a little weird in the language at that point. But yeah, so he was very interested in a lot of this stuff from the beginning. And that's kind of what caused the split with Freud. And after the split with Freud, he kind of lost a lot of professional credibility, a lot of his friends and students and everything over being called a mystic and a mysticizer and stuff. Because, you know, Freud believed everything came back to sex, essentially. Like it was all back to the sex drive, that type of stuff. And Jung thought there were other drives, including drives that were like, you know, more based in the spiritual world and more meaning-based. And yeah, that there was kind of, well, he does use the term psychic energy, but not in the way that we would usually talk about psychic energy. (laughs) So yeah, he thought there were more drives, more things that people wanted than just sex. And Freud basically just called all of this mystic and didn't want Jung going off in that direction. And the split caused huge amount of turmoil for Jung, at which point he was around 35 and he kind of dropped into the unconscious because he was at a, yeah, very much at a crossroads in his life. 
and that's where the red book comes in is he just started diving into the unconscious simmering there and seeing the imagery that comes up and what was what he was encountering in his soul basically and the, he based the rest of his career off of those encounters essentially until he found alchemy and essentially was like oh all the stuff that i like discovered in my internal imagery work has already been talked about in the world's alchemy traditions i'm gonna stop writing my thing and just work on alchemy until i die cool let's go with that (laughs) but yeah so does that point towards kind of an answer definitely definitely thank you um one of the things that you've mentioned to me and also on twitter is about this technique of Jungian active imagination and the way you talk about it you're like yeah it's a technique but like you kind of just figure it out and he figured it out for himself and uh just try it but I wonder if you could talk about just what it is or what your experience of it is and how someone who is curious about it could learn more about it or give it a try yeah if you yeah if you're curious about it basically look up any that term active imagination active dreaming uh I think Robert Moss is a good one for that. But in general, it is more of an attitude than anything else. And the attitude is kind of in the name, active and imagination. It's kind of an active stance towards the unconscious and towards the imagination. That you're not just like sitting there and daydreaming, spinning off, but basically that you go in with this attitude of, I am going to be with the unconscious, sit with the unconscious, and things are going to happen. Something is going to come of this. Something is going to transform from this. And seeing what comes out of that. And for some people, that will be art. Art is a very fecund point here, (laughs) where, yeah, people will paint over and over again until they find, like, the image that is calling to them and paint with that they'll dance do it sometimes that way the way that i do it was the first way i learned was basically take a meaningful image hold it in your mind until it starts acting on its own so yeah if there's like you're trying to commune with more like lunar qualities of yourself picture a moon goddess hold that image in your mind until she starts doing something that you didn't tell her to do, basically. So, like, you are not trying to imagine her arm moving in a wave. You're just picturing, like, holding the image in your mind, and suddenly she starts waving. Okay, follow that. Engage with that. All right, you waved back, imaginally, and now she's stepping up onto a horse. Cool. Are you able to follow her? And just kind of keep following that. So that's kind of the simplest version. It's like take a meaningful image, hold it in your mind, and see where it goes. Like hold it in your mind until it starts doing its own thing. More important than that nowadays for me is like the mood or the emotional tone or, yeah, just kind of whatever mind or soul texture you're sitting with that you dig into that and usually an image will come up on its own like if i'm feeling a lot of anger and i just you know lie down i close my eyes and i just try to feel in my body in my mind kind of yeah just in my phenomenological system here where is that anger what is it doing pretty much always some visual or smell or sound or something will come up and then you don't just like i don't just like sit and take that in and like okay there's a wolf there wolves are proud maybe i'm like not exhibiting my pride enough and it's causing anger so i need to like push back in situations and set my boundaries better no it's much more just Yeah, not accepting that image, but engaging with it, like following it, 
and yeah, it gets hard to talk about because it's there's so many thousands of different ways it might go. Sometimes mm-hmm. I might feel like, okay, like I am that wolf, so I need to like enter that mind space, or maybe like, oh, the wolf is something I need to kill, so I need to manifest like a spear and start chasing it down. And then it turns into a fog monster that I can't stab and wraps itself around me, (laughs) right? But yeah, like at its core, I think everyone kind of needs to figure out quote unquote active imagination for themselves in their own way. But there's a lot of good ways to like prime the pump, I think. There's tons of exercises that are recommended for just like getting the imaginal faculty up and running, getting in touch with kind of your emotions, the energetic textures that you've got kind of sifting around in there. And yeah, engaging with them in ways that is not just kind of watching them or like only accepting them or trying to intellectualize them, which is another route that every time I see someone talking about dreams like in tv and movies and stuff it always gets very intellectualized very quickly just oh the watchtower is your fear of death and like that's i think berbea talked about that a few times as well but i know the guy hillman hillman talked a lot about like working with the image and not intellectualizing the image that you come in with an image and you need to work with that If you come in with an image and you leave with a concept, something has gone wrong. Mm. But yeah, so kind of within that zone, if anyone like plays around for a while with those basic principles, you'll start to like find your way towards what is fruitful active imagination for you. And yeah, a lot of like your practice reports weekly sound to me like, yeah, Tashin just discovered active imagination for himself because we all can do that and it's there (laughs) it's there for us Mm. would you mind telling me about uh like what your experience of doing this technique has been like or like one image that you worked with that was significant for you or something in that direction yeah i'll just pick the one i've talked about before on twitter a couple times i think uh Mm -hmm. the buffalo Mm. there's a cosmic buffalo and that one was i picked what I often do is like start with dream imagery. So just take something from one of my dreams recently that has felt meaningful and rich. And then while I'm awake, try to sink back into not just like the visual of it, but the feeling of it, the emotional tone there. And yeah, for me, one of these major dreams involved a... (laughs) Which parts of this dream are relevant? Just a second. (laughs) It's a whole long dream. I don't want to get into the whole thing. Yeah, there's a buffalo on an island, and I'm watching him from a hilltop where I can also see on the other hand, there's like a broken down plaza of people and their children. And the children are all running a play on a loop that is just the last day basically. The world has like changed and essentially ended recently and the children are running a play of the last day while the parents all just watch them in this plaza and they're ignoring that behind them on this little island in a lake is this cosmic bison who is like gestating the new world basically. Like he's kind of ruminating and whatever the new reality is, is going to be emanating from him. So in the actual dream, I went down to the plaza and also watched the children put on their play of the dead past that was no longer there. In the act of imagination, I went back to the hilltop where I had both in front of me and walked out across a sandbar onto the island to like meet the bison and see what was happening there. And a lot kind of happened there. Um, Yeah, this one, it was one of those things where it sounds trite, but like one of those things that is just always true and you always know it, but sometimes you feel it in your body and it 
finally becomes like somatically true for you. And yeah, I just asked the bison, like, what comes next? What is the path? What do I need to do? And then he just drew my attention to the fact that I was lying somewhere, like, after meditation and drumming and dropping down, lying on the floor in active imagination. It's like, you're here. You're doing this. Seems like this is your path, right? It's like, okay, fine. That's true. Doesn't seem particularly helpful, but thank you. And then I just kind of sat with the bison and watched, like, the pattern around the island. There was the pattern of the new world was starting to like come into being. And I just sat and watched there with them and just sitting in that space felt very like edifying and rich. And over the next week or two, that thing that didn't seem helpful at first, just like, seems like this is your path. This is where you are. The ground under your feet is your path became much more of like a felt experience for me in a way that like I've always you know it's a thing everyone will always say stuff like oh your path is wherever you are the ground under your feet you find your own way but it finally like clicked in a way that it just hadn't before and it was directly emerging from that particular imaginative experience And yeah, like I still have a feeling of the bison with me, basically, like slightly behind me to the left. I can like kind of feel him (laughs) just hanging out there still. And yeah, like I don't think that would have become nearly as clear, nearly as quickly, or maybe ever in that felt sense way, if I hadn't dropped back into that dream and like actively engaged with the imagery and experience that was there. Hmm. I'm getting this sense from talking to you and, and of course from knowing you for a while about like, this is just me interpreting your life from hearing you talk about it, but like that you're sort of at a pivot point from like, you've done a lot of deep dives into different thinkers and traditions and practices and you've, like found how those relate and what works for you. And like, it seems to me like you're transitioning into uh, like an active phase of creating and collaborating and building and exploring and sort of reconfiguring different things and sharing them and discovering. Uh, Does that resonate for you? Very, very much so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I wonder if we could talk about some of the things that I've seen you create or put out in the world or like even just a a like oh there's an intention to do this uh like starting maybe a good place to start would be I've recently discussed this on the podcast a little bit but would love to hear about it from you of this Temenos account that you run both like historically it's been kind of about the Jung stuff and depth psychology and then you know a couple months ago you decided to start supplementing that by inviting several people including myself, to contribute under these different voices. And I wonder if you might talk about that project and what you were sensing or hoping for there. Yeah. So it's kind of based off of some ideas that I've like kicked around before about basically that all, all of us should have access to more archetypal ways of being and like yeah senses of meaningful ways to be and this idea that like I envision a society a beautiful place where (laughs) you know you can have two people talking and like consciously speaking to each other as like archetypal beings as kind of in the Jungian sense like from the spirit of the depths rather than the spirit of the times that instead of like Tom and Joe talking to each other about this week's happening, they're able to find themselves in a situation and like have a container available to them where one can, they, they can find themselves dropping into a deeper way of speaking that is like, okay, I'm not saying my specific thoughts and ideas, but I feel something like, you know, the all father, 
speaking through me, like the archetypal father of humanity. And that is speaking through me. And then in reaction to that, as Joe starts speaking from the place of that, the father, Tom finds that that's reacting in him to bring up, I don't know, the voice of a sea slug from ancient times, who's the proto-ancestor of all of us, right? (laughs) But whatever kind of these strange archetypal images and energies are, because I've talked to a lot of people over the years about like Jungian topics and archetypes in particular, a lot of people really resonate with archetypes. And it seems like most people do have some experience of like invoking or evoking other voices, other presences into themselves. And whether they filter that as, oh, the god Hermes is speaking through me, or they filter it as, yeah, there's some, like, deeply ingrained part of the human brain that, like, is a network built for fathering, and that kicks on sometimes, and I can feel the father as, like, a presence there. Yeah, people seem to feel this a lot, but almost no one knows what to do with it particularly. Most I've found is like some artists and particularly writers are really good at like guiding that so they can find voices to project, right? But yes, in this smaller sense, that was Temenos is kind of the first little experiment in just like, hey guys, all of you seem to be like on a wavelength where you could tap into things like this. Let's try tapping into that and like putting them together into one place. And yeah, went okay. <laughs> the I'd like to do like, like another version of this in some way. Because th- just the way that Twitter works, like it was each person kind of, it was still quite atomized, right? With like one person's tweet here, the next one's tweet here, the next archetype tweets here. And I would love a place where those can like be more gelling in conversation with each other or even if not in conversation just kind of like bouncing off of each other and riffing a bit more yeah the current iteration of it is i think probably done right like let me let me go check the yeah (laughs) yeah i'm the only one who's posted for the past two or three weeks here this iteration feels about done but there was a lot of really great stuff from that and i would love to like find another format that really resonates and like can continue with that but temenos itself will probably be going back to depth psychology and jungian stuff Hmm. fairly (laughs) soonish does that answer some part definitely definitely yes uh both what i asked and the follow-up question I was planning to ask. So that's perfect. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd like to ask as well about um, recently you had this thread of, uh, oh, how I shall I describe this? Um, you had this thread that was observing that some trends that are currently being discussed in say buddhist twitter are things that you've been saying for some time and then (laughs) you're sort of looking back on that like you know that meditation is overemphasized and that uh here i'll I'll quote this uh enlightenment being somewhere between incoherent unappealing and a bad time investment (laughs) and then uh and pulling together an alternate idea based around alignment or congruence and you said and now everyone's getting on the do things that aren't meditation boat. And um, then you proceed to make a series of, uh, shall we say, predictions about what you think will happen in the future. And of course, uh, it occurs to me reading this now that there's some aspect of, uh, you know, hyperstition, essentially, of directing things, making it so that it will arise this way by putting it this way. But um, I want to ask you about some of the specific uh, points that you made in that thread of, of where you see things going in the future and just hear more from you about those. Um, 
Yeah, so, let's go for it. And j just to be clear, like there's an element of tongue in cheek here. I don't want this to come off like too much that I am the prophet who sees Oh, sure. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I thought it was both funny and um, curious. I don't know. Um, I think there's something uh, true about it. You know, it wasn't, I did, it didn't strike me as like, oh, I'm the prophet or something. We're just kind of reflecting, okay, here's where we've been <laughs> and here's where I think we might go. Um, yeah, so I would love to hear maybe to start, because this is the first of these ideas that I heard you talk about is about these co-learner workshops. You said, I really like the idea of creating spaces that are less about, I will teach you X and more about let's dive into X together. Can you talk about that and the kind of thing that you'd like to see from these uh, co-learner workshops? Yeah, so this came pretty directly out of trying to like find a way to discuss Jung more fruitfully and discuss what I find appealing about Jung more fruitfully. And one of the main downsides of talking about Jung is essentially that he gets heavily over-intellectualized and that a lot of people's entry point is essentially, you know, this list of Jungian terms and their definitions, put together a flashcard deck and we'll get started. Where it seems to me much more fruitful is the exploratory attitude. And I, I can't find the tweet. I'm not going to try to find it right now. But yeah, like that the very special thing about Jung is not like this new technique that he discovered and these new things that he, but that his attitude of going inside with an open mind and with like knowledge and acuity and openness, but without the like, without total naivete and yeah, with just like a good balance of be careful. This is like a very real space that you are engaging with but also don't just ask everyone else what you should be doing and follow their things like find what works for you what feels right to you and to do this you'll have to develop some intuitive faculty for yourself and yeah i was trying to like i was just having a hell of a time trying to figure out how to like communicate this in a way especially to like a small group of people that it might actually be of service, might land, might actually help someone, rather than just being one more thing to like, all right, here's your handbook on like starting Buddhist meditation over here, your handbook on Sufi poetry over here, and then your handbook on Jungian techniques over here. Like, yeah, in a way that might like sink in as, hey, you can find your path and like it will intersect a lot with other paths but it's kind of got to be yours to like really land for some people, right? And yeah, at the same time, there was, I think you, yeah, you've said this several times, but I've seen an attitude generally around of like, yeah, just the distrust of teachers and gurus and that it's very helpful often to engage with people who are, in a manner of speaking, like one or two steps ahead of you rather than way up there and stuff. And yeah, co-learning workshops is still kind of a coalescing idea for me, but I think it would be really helpful to have just a couple of people who have more or less like figured out the direction that they're going, have figured out what works for them, what doesn't, not so much to like teach that to other people as if it's going to also work for them, but to kind of help guide that process. Go like, well, this is what I did to help figure it out. You could start there and work from there. Because it seems like people have a really difficult time getting started. Like my vision for these, not just on Jung, but like on a lot of other topics, is hopefully that people will get what they will get from this will be examples of other people who have done this and i think it's really important that they see like the people's personalities and what they're like where they've been and then 
have that to compare with the path that landed for them. Because so many of the other teachings and traditions seem really disembodied to me. Like, I, not to speak too broadly and generally, but like a lot of Zen hits for me pretty well. But it seems to me like a missing element of Zen, particularly from my perspective, is the element of like, hey, there's some personalities that this is really going to work for and some of you that it's just not going to really. Mm -hmm. And when a lot of these things become too instantiated, we lose track of that personal element. And I would just like to get that back and co-learning workshops seem like a great way. <laughs> like what you're doing with Saturday Night Meta seems really on there. It's just smaller groups of people. Hey, Meta can be all these different things. Find your way over towards Meta. Excellent. Love it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Interesting. <clears throat> What's your sense of why these sort of I mean I mean I mean I know you personally from your description you personally have had this like very customized idiosyncratic all over the place spiritual path uh it seems like you're sort of generalizing that to say hey at this time this is how people are going to walk their spiritual path is in their own way that's not uh necessarily the same as a previous path that's been walked uh, can you speak more to that and why why you think that is it is a general thing and not just the way it worked for you, but something that's really needed now or, or something to that effect? The first thing that comes to mind, I want to find my tweet here. <laughs> um, can't remember the right keywords. It's not coming up. The one um, you said in the phrase is it's going to be a whole bunch of highly bespoke inner paths people draw from their own life systems rather than copying traditions. And then you quote mm. tweeted for you or me, it's less important to follow his example. This is Jung, I think by a technique mm. than it is to follow his example by via recalling our own integrative instincts. Yeah. To zoom out from this slightly for a moment, mm -hmm. a big part of this is another thing that I tweeted that I can't find, but I'll just mm -hmm. re say it like a mm -hmm. normal person instead <laughs> of finding my own quotes. Um, no, basically that I've been struggling more and more with the kind of tension between either like a over qualifying how I speak, like for me and my personal experience, I have found and some other people might find that X, Y, Z mm -hmm. versus just like dropping it, just X, Y, Z period. <laughs> and this is very much in that zone where like, I'm not saying like, the traditions and structures and organizations can't work anymore and they're all going to collapse and it's done. For a lot of people, they seem to work perfectly fine. They're all mm -hmm. still going great. <laughs> but I do see people around and particularly like in our corner of Twitter, which is what my audience is when I'm talking like this, who, yeah, don't seem to have the requisite either like ability to trust a tradition in that way or like kind of yeah reasons aside people who are for whatever reason unable to just hand themselves over to a particular teacher or particular tradition and who seem to need much more of an element of like discovery to it and part of that I think is just our social circles in general and Part of it, I do think, is just, you know, our cultural moment, like authority and experts in as a general sense of vocabulary have not had a great few years <laughs> and people are much more open to the idea that, oh, like I can, like other people might be able to figure out what will work best for 70% of people in most cases. But if I'm looking for something that is my life, my way, how I need things to be, like, I don't like the word optimized, but optimized for me, then yeah, like, maybe I'm the best person to do that. I'm the best one to, like, actually put that together with help from others and with help from 
like the masters of other traditions and stuff. But by and large, I'm not going to just hand myself over to someone and like just trust that what they kind of put me through is the thing I need to be put through, right? So yeah, big part of this is just that that is my sense that there are people out there like me. <laughs> and another part is just, yeah, the language game of like, hey, maybe going to just your local Soto Zen Center and just kind of hanging out is 100% the thing for you. If so, don't listen to me. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Go do that. Uh -huh. um, one of the, the, the final thing that you say in this thread is that you see as well probably a shift towards more poetic, less technical ways of expressing mm. these paths and experiences. And you, um, and yeah, yeah, can you speak to why? Th this makes total sense to me, but can you speak to why language would be an important aspect of that and what you're seeing there? I've, yeah, I've been feeling a lot more tension about that lately, and I've been seeing a lot of tension about that for the past at least year or so. Mm -hmm. But just that, you know, contemplative discussion and discourse is tends to be ruled by Buddhism generally mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. they're kind of the ones with all right we've got the meditation maps we've got all the stuff we're going to use buddhist language and buddhist maps for this it's fine but in our time and culture buddhism and like med particularly like heavily focused on meditation buddhism tends to be ruled by highly structured minds like the the engineering brain thing and for me that kills it just absolutely kills it um yeah there's one of my other tweets that i think you put in the thing earlier mm -hmm. that i i still like but i took some shit for that one mm -hmm. ah yes enlightenment is attainable for everyone about a decade's worth of hard work and you can do it way to make awakening sound like becoming middle management at a regional bank bro <laughs> yeah that sense has been extremely it's been a big obstacle for me over the past couple of years of just trying to get past, trying to get back that spark of like exploration and discovery and divinity and sacredness rather than this sense of like, like I'm putting together a computer at home. Like, all right, you lock this many hours of meditation into this many hours of energetic practice, put in just a little bit of therapy. Good, good. All right, let's run a current through that, see if it gets going. It just kills everything for me. And yeah, again, I seem to be not the only one that is like this. And even people, just because that is the language that's available, I've seen a lot of people getting stuck on this language and on these types of framing where they'll say like, all right, I don't really mean this. This is going to sound way too structured and like ruly, mm -hmm. but this, this, this. And yeah, I think and hope, and I've been starting to see like some people leaning more in the direction of like descriptive if not poetic at least like personally descriptive stuff rather than sticking with kind of the overly to me overly technical framings that were often given and that often rule the discussion but yeah i've talked a lot about enlightenment over the past year or two and like i'm just gonna stop using the term basically mm -hmm. because the people who tend to use and to my mind, like kind of rule that term and kind of own that term are so technical minded and mean such a small thing by it that I just can't engage with it anymore without feeling a sense of barrenness of, yeah, just kills me. <laughs> you say in that term, in that thread, you quote, another tweet that says what I lean towards more and more is my preferred term to gesture towards my aim is alignment or congruence. Uh, can you speak to that and what you're sensing or wanting there? Yeah, a lot of that I think comes from my working theory is that like, I, I'm, I'm reincarnated from like some dude who was really into Taoism in the last part of last century or something because <laughs> mm -hmm. 
I, a lot of, I wrote a lot of fiction when I was younger. And from like 10 to 15, I have a bunch of stories and like one unfinished novel that all center on the sense of uh, the current, basically, which is essentially just the Tao. But at that point, like, I had not yet heard of the Tao or knew anything that it was. <laughs> and yeah, just the sense that, yeah, sense of a flow that needs to be happening. Something that we need to not just surrender to, but participate with and give into this flow, become part of this flow. And that has always super appealed to me. And so alignment to me and congruence kind of mean yeah finding a way to not just you know not just let go and float downstream but to actively participate in that flow and like align yourself such that the things that you want and need and bend towards are the things that the current wants and needs and bend towards and yeah just to be a part of that essentially Hmm. it's interesting to me that you mentioned having written a lot of fiction as a kid and one of the things that you've imparted most to me in our relationship is a renewed love of fiction and stories and myths and you know novels and shows or movies that we've watched or something and we've talked a lot about them and you know you've recommended a lot of stories to me that I've quite liked and um, I think for me it's been an experience of um, remembering that I love stories and a renewed sense of why that might actually be significant and not just I don't know an idle distraction or something or that I should feel guilty about or something I don't know Um, And I would be curious to hear you speak to that about what stories mean to you, the stories that you've written, the stories that you've been exposed to, the myths that have been significant for you. Just take that in whatever direction you'd like. Yeah, I've like, I've had a very similar trajectory on that. Yeah, I, I noticed a few months ago that I kind of have like an internal midwit meme going on with that where when I was younger I was like stories are all that matters and they're beautiful and wonderful and the world is a story everything's a story and then I got into the like oh no it's all just silly distractions that keep us from what's really important and blah 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 and now I'm kind of back into like oh stories are everything everything is just stories that we're telling and we can tell ourselves good stories or we can tell ourselves shitty stories but we're always telling ourselves a story even if that story is the world is a cold, dead place with no stories and they don't matter. All that matters is putting your nose to the grindstone and doing what needs to be done and ignoring that silly crap. That's still a story that is in your head that you're telling yourself, right? And yeah, a big part of it for me has been back to Rob Berbea, but the way that he draws attention to the pervasiveness of the imaginal faculty, basically. Just that we always have it on right? That there's not really an option to turn off fabrication, to turn off your narrative making machine in your head. You can like turn it very low to like just the smallest, tiny little quiver, but it's kind of always there. And that there's a few things you can do with that. You can stick with your default stories that have been is inculcated a word? Why is inculcated coming to me? That's that's real? Okay. Yep. <laughs> but yeah, that have been like programmed into you unskillfully throughout your life, whether through family, trauma, culture, whatever. And these stories might serve you or might not. Or you can like sink into those, see the places where they're not serving you, kind of dismantle the stories that lock you into a particular way of being and give more energy to the stories that open things for you, that create more possibilities. I think you just retweeted yesterday Visa's old tweet of the, like, give more energy to the things that you want to see in the world. Focus your time and energy on what you want to see in the world. There it is. 
and yeah, that is what, essentially what the same thing. Of. Yeah, that's essentially the same thing, just without the storytelling language. Mm-hmm. But in order to have what you want to see more of, and in order to focus your time and energy on it, you need that internal story of how to do that and why to do that. And yeah, incredibly wise tweet there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the big thing for me the past couple of years has been like, I think you, I don't think you said this, but you sparked it for me at like one of our first meetings that basically that thing that happens in dreams where like knowledge is just in the air where you're in a supermarket and like, you know that there's a man-eating tiger in the freezer in the back room and like, you shouldn't go there. You don't see it. You don't smell it. You don't hear it. But like, you have that sense, that faculty that like, yes, there is knowing that it is over there. And that that's really front and center in dream. We notice it as a strange thing in our dreams, but that it's always with us. Like every day, there's tons of things that I like know or have like the emotional sense of. And then when I dig into it further, I'm just like, oh, that's the same sense as in a dream. Like my girlfriend is teaching a student in the other room right now. I can't see, sense, hear that, but that's the story I'm living with. And I know it's happening. But for all I know, her internet kicked out there and she moved over there or we ran out of water and she needed to head out to the supermarket. I don't know. But internally, that's my sense of our apartment right now is I have a knowing that she is over there, the cats are there and there. And yeah, just that that's the same basic thing as in dream, just used in a different way, fabricating in a slightly different way, telling that story in a way that seems a little different, but is the same basic faculty. (laughs) What has it been like for you to sort of arrive at this third stage of the midwit meme where you have a renewed sense of why stories are important and and how are you holding or engaging with stories at this time? I mean, kind of what you just said, the why stories are important. Like Mm -hmm. the beginning of the midwit meme (laughs) was more... more idealistic and naive and just that like you know more the stories can change the world and it'll be great and now i have more of a sense of like what the functions of stories are and how they operate on all of us and that that can be wonderful (laughs) or it can be really terrible and how that's been working for me is much more attention to the types of stories that I put into my imaginal organ, whatever that is. And yeah, so like sharing stories with you sometimes, pretty much all of the stories that I've shared with you are ones that I think are like enriching or helpful in some way or other. Mm -hmm. Uh, Semiosis, incredibly enriching, particularly in that like other forms of life other than humans have value, right? And the ways that like your environment changes you, that the people who moved to that planet, like total difference in lifestyle and even in bodies between like the older generation and the younger ones later. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think that there's a lot there. You read that story and that puts a lot of good things into your ecosystem, right? Whereas, yeah, like I had a few weeks here recently where I was just in a holding pattern because I was looking for an apartment. I just moved to a new country. My partner wasn't here. And I just kind of watched like way too many episodes of some dumbass sitcom that I didn't even like while I was watching it. I was just numbing myself out. That wasn't positive. That's the, (laughs) I've got like the equivalent of, imaginal lactose intolerance now i'm just like oh that wasn't good for me gotta Mm. clean that out of the system okay (laughs) Mm. but and yeah i i shill the oa a lot the netflix show because i think that that's one of the more enriching things that people can be putting into their environment and i will probably rewatch that fairly soon Mm. because it's awesome but yeah just the sense of like that they have a function and that they can 
alter the way that you experience your life and that you experience the patterns of other people's lives and what is happening around you. And that they can do that in a very helpful and skillful way that guides you towards openness and possibility. Or that they can do that in a way that makes you scared or angry or numb or whatever, right? Mm. Mm. Whereas, yeah, towards the middle of the thing, I think I would have only seen it as numbing, mostly. Mm -hmm. That all we're doing here is, oh, this story isn't like giving you more faculty for bravery and like courage in your daily life it's just numbing you out by making you feel like you could have bravery but actually it's bullshit <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that i really have related to that and been sort of opened by that of like um hmm. i think for a time i yeah, there was a point where I've discussed this with you where I committed to not watching movies anymore unless they're documentaries, just kind of indefinitely. And this whole shift has made me want to revisit that of like, oh, I think movies are very powerful. And if I'm not using them, you know, I, I did that because I was like, oh, I've watched so many movies. It was like addictive for me at a certain point where I would just watch, you know, there were days where th there was a stretch of like three or four months some years ago where I watched a movie literally every day. And sometimes it was like two or three movies in one day. And uh, it was like, okay, this is unhealthy and addictive and it is kind of numbing and um, something like that. But then, um, you know, you pointed out, uh, like last year, I wrote this blog post about the Ender's Game series and you sort of reflected back to me what I already said in there, but just that like the stories that we keep coming back to really have some significance or meaning for us. And that's made me want to dive deeper into sort of specific stories that I've really resonated with and uh, connected to and keep finding are in my own like, yeah, like inner ecosystem or inner mythology or like sense making systems. And, you know, I have a list of maybe like 12 or 13 stories in a private list somewhere of like, oh, these are the ones that I keep coming back to and really have been chewing on for a long time. And I have sort of, it, it's a very ambitious project, but sort of the intention to like, chew on that and see like what is it about these stories that's really hit me and impacted me and uh what is there still to understand or reflect there and um yeah that's just been a really powerful way of looking for me of like oh maybe these stories aren't just a waste of time or something but they're really um you know fertile for significance and meaning and purpose in life and self-knowledge and knowledge of others and direction and so on um and just just like also like charging refueling clarifying uh that they can have this like very wholesome quality if if you're if you wield it well that it's not just oh i'm numbing out and uh, repressing things or something like that for sure yeah mild tangent mm -hmm. for a moment here but <laughs> one of the stories that for me like i would definitely class as like i keep coming back to it and it holds a very specific place for me is a uh, wind up bird chronicle by mm. haruki murakami mm. and the first time i read it i got halfway through and got interrupted and had to like set it aside for several weeks and then it became a whole thing of like how much do I remember the first half? Like, it's been too little time to reread it, but I'm not sure if I can just continue reading and still remember everything. And, like, it felt really shitty. And I remember it, like, sticking out to me that, like, you know, it doesn't usually feel, feel this shitty when I, like, get halfway through a book and then get distracted. And what I'm kind of realizing now is that, like, yeah, I already knew at that point that it was really speaking to me and was an important book for me, and that I felt bad about, like, aborting the experience in that way. And now I'm, like, in, I've been in the same situation now with a different book for several months, because I was, on my Kindle, I was 50% through, um, what's the book? Nomen by Nick Harkaway, when I found out that my visa wasn't being renewed in Vietnam. And, like, my whole life went on pause right from there. And I haven't, like, I've been reading other stuff since then, but that book has just been 
stuck on 50% since then. And now, yeah, I feel guilty about like going back to it when I might not remember all the stuff from before, but it's also bit, not been enough time to like reread the first half. And I feel like this is going to be like, even from the first half of that book, it felt like electrifying. <laughs> and I think it's going to continue to be like a really special book to me. But now I, again, am in the position where I feel bad about pausing one in the middle that does seem like a very nourishing book and not knowing what the right way to continue with it is. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Only lightly connected to what we were talking about, but still. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hmm. uh, I wonder if one of the things that you mentioned, you mentioned on Twitter that you were hoping to talk about uh, expanding the available narratives and archetypes of spiritual life and people. Um, is that something you'd like to discuss now? Yeah, very briefly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, we can dig into it more later. Mm -hmm. My throat's getting a little off. <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, we've talked about this a little before. Do you have any particular feelings you'd like to share on the topic? Can you say briefly what made you think of me that you wanted to talk about this with me? Uh, we've, must have been a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, just at various times, we've talked about narrative, story, characters, and particularly about like available spiritual archetypes. Mm -hmm. I think you mentioned particularly in Buddhism and mm -hmm. then me for a lot of other ones. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there doesn't seem to be a ton of variety available mm -hmm. these days if someone is thinking like, you know, where someone can put themselves in the shoes as a spiritual practitioner of, as I move forward, I'm like moving towards this, towards embodying this ideal, stepping, excuse me, stepping into this archetype and so on. You pretty much got like a sea of just really calm, equanimous figures with a vague, airy wisdom around them. Like, oh boy, if I work hard and follow my dreams, one day I can laconically give non-answers from a cushion in front of some people. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't seem like a great motivator to me. Uh -huh. And even just looking, and it doesn't seem like it's always been that way. Like you look back at some of the, I mean, you just look back at the, what is it, 74 Mahasiddhas or whatever, mm. but some of the Tantric Mahasiddhas, there's some crazy stories in there. And those were like, Oh, yeah, and the Catholic saints, of course, there's tons of those, Jesus. But yeah, there seems to have been tons of available stories of like, oh, you're a thief and a murderer? Here's a path to sacredness to you. This dude was a thief and a murderer, and then he, you know, follow up with some insane story that leads to him killing a pig on the streets of Florence and realizing the light of God while taking out the pig's heart. Like, <laughs> okay, that's a path. We got that. But no, for us, it tends to just be like, all right, if you sit really quietly in this room and like be kind of smiley at people in your general day-to-day -day life, and in about 15 years, you'll have some like strange experiences that will make for like a difficult few months and then, bang, bang, boom, you can be calm and smiley and <laughs> look at people with a nice airy grin from time to time. Like, And I'm vastly oversimplifying, of course, but like, we know the things I'm talking about here. Wow. <laughs> There's kind of a depleted ecosystem of available people to be. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, this reminds me of a few themes in my own life that we've talked about a bit but like one of them is the bodhisattva vows you asked me about this and um you know i went through this sort of stage of like being terrified of them and then just like resigning to them and then eventually over time there's been this um development of my own relationship to them where they are a sort of pattern that's an available narrative of oh you take these vows and this is what they are but i've kind of come into my own relationship with them that that sort of clicks for me and allows me to hold them 
both lightly and with significance and like give my life to them. Um, that's, I know it's, it's sort of on the one side of all I have to do is be of service and give this life to being of service, which is a tall order, but it's perfectly feasible. It's just like try to be of some benefit with this life and hope that that's good. It's like kind of a, it's both, of course, it's like, oh, I have to give my life to this. But, but other than that, it's like a low bar of just like, all I have to do is try to help, you know, and be of service, right? I might not even be very good at it for all we know. <laughs> uh, and then the high bar is like, okay, I'm vowing to be a Buddha in a future lifetime and this life and every future life is about going towards that where a buddha is someone that uh, has been through so many lives and is so completely realized that they can be of benefit to each and every being that they meet and teach them in a way that's beneficial to them just where they are without harming them but just being of benefit and um even though that's also a really tall order extremely tall order um in the way that I hold it, it's like, oh, the pressure is off there too, because I just have to use this life to learn what I can in this life. And like, I don't think I'm going to be a Buddha in this lifetime. So uh, just try to develop and grow and learn things and be of benefit and serve and develop spiritually in the ways that I can in the order that I can, you know, kind of this custom path that we're talking about of like, okay, um, what works for me now and who I am in this life. And that's not necessarily going to be the same as what other people do. And um, hopefully I hope, I hope and pray that that will take me in a good direction in this life and ideally future lives. Um, but I can hold that, like there can both be holding it lightly, which was present in the fear that I had beforehand of, Oh no, this, the way that people tend to talk about this seems impossible and terrible and like, going to be it's going to kill me and i'm just going to fail and go to hell or something i don't know i'm exaggerating here but there was this kind of fear mm -hmm. about it for me to like actually being able to hold it lightly but also actually give my life to this of like here we go i'm going to be of service and learn what i can and try to help people where i can and just if i make mistakes then i'm going to try to learn from those and just do the good that i can with this life and that feels like such a more relaxed and fruitful way of holding it that it's not too tight but it's not like meaningless either and um, that's something I've had to come into a relationship with for myself over time and there's a similar thing of course with um, monasticism of like uh, in, in my own life I felt really called at a certain point for certain reasons to do monastic training and I did do monastic training for a while and then left and even when I was in monastic training it was like oh I'm in this weird contemporary novel brand new baby tradition that's not like other existing traditions and has rules that are different than the rules that are more traditional and is therefore is it really a monastery am I really a monk and had a lot of agonizing doubt about that and um, now it's like oh well I'm a lay person but I've sort of similarly crafted my own narrative of like well I'm a and this is just how I see it today as we're talking but like oh I am a lay person that is dedicated to being of service and to cultivating a spiritual path. Uh, but I'm living a simple life that's, you know, informed by all of the training I did in a monastery. And I'm not like getting a car or a house or like I'm trying to have a low impact on the environment. And also just currently, it seems like I'm sort of wandering as a pilgrim where I'll go from place to place for four to six weeks or something and just connect really deeply to the people that I'm with and uh, have that be my home base for a little bit and then move to the next place and be just kind of this wandering pilgrim that's, you know, of course, far more on the lay side than monk, but like my own path of being a pilgrim and a wanderer and living a simple life that's dedicated to being of service and, you know, is also based on generosity where I accept people's generosity to support me and feed me and clothe me and you know, pay for the various software subscriptions that I have that make things like this possible, you know, um, but it's still a, a very simple life where, you know, I'm not, um, I don't know, I don't have an apartment or a house or a mortgage or a retirement fund or something like that. And um, that's, that's something that I've really wrestled with over time and come into a relationship that feels really wholesome and right for me at this time in my life. And I'm sure it'll continue to change. Um, but um I guess there's something else as well with like teaching of like 
you know, I was asked to teach in the tradition that I was in, and that was really confusing and difficult. And like, oh, am I a teacher? What is a teacher? And how do you hold that relationship well as knowing how important a student teacher relationship had been to me and like imposter syndrome of can I really do that? And now it's like, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, I've done a bunch of loving kindness meditation and I can help you with that. And I'll do some guidances and talk about it and hope that it inspires people and helps people. And I, you know, can say things that are relevant and useful to people, but like, I'm not awakened. I'm not enlightened. I'm not a perfect teacher. Uh, I'm just somebody that can help you if you're interested in loving kindness. And if you're not, no problem. There's lots of other stuff out there. And that's something as well that's really felt um, like true to what I have to offer the world at this time without being, you know, there's a theme here of not holding some concept too strictly, but just showing up and meeting the environment as it is and being of service. And, you know, coming out of that, there's sort of these unexpected things that if you told me six months ago, I was going to be doing, I'd be like, that's crazy. But now I make like music videos where I'm dancing. And it's like, this is my way of serving the world through demonstrating loving kindness in this really idiosyncratic, weird, funky, cool way. And uh, that's not, no, nobody ever sat me down. I was like, Tashin, you need to give your life to making music videos related to loving kindness. You know, no one ever told me that, but it arose of like, this is a thing that I could do that would be of service in the world and be of some benefit. And it was clear to me, oh, this is what needs to happen and how I can give my life at this time. And uh, so be it. So um, that that's a lot of the themes that come up for me around, like, I guess a, a theme of receiving an existing narrative that I could trust and be like, okay, these same people seem to know what they're talking about and it's established and good and approved of by people that I trust. But then when it enters my system and my life, I like hold it too tightly and conceive of it too strongly. And that causes emotional stress and friction. And then if I let go of that and loosen, I find a relationship with it. That's like true to the values underneath it, but authentic to my own self and my own experience and my own needs. And backgrounds and preferences at this time that I can actually hold in a way that's of benefit to others. Yeah, love all of that. And the last part most, yeah, the last part seems incredibly important to me, just like what your relationship with receiving that tradition and that those like ideas, those like pre-served ideas and how you can engage with them, work with them fruitfully. That seems like a huge inflection point to me where like different people will have different like unexamined ideas and reflexes towards how to engage with those types of things which is you know for me fairly obvious like I grew up with a whole lot of like literalist fundamentalist people like oh no this thing is exactly this and you have to hold it exactly this way there's no wiggle room like yeah the book of Job is precisely historical fact. They walked into the desert and spoke in poetry for seven days. That is what happened. Get on the bandwagon with us. <laughs> and so, like, for me, coming towards a lot of these other traditions, I do think that, like, yeah, a healthy attitude that a lot of people do have is that you can receive these things and then work with them in your own way. And I see people like you and several other folks, note most notably, who do this very well and very fruitfully and then i also see people like me who just are lacking a particular faculty for that hmm. and the most not the most comfortable but like the most expedient way is not to like receive a thing and then personalize it it's to kind of you know either just completely go it alone and only vaguely check in with the other stuff or to just pile as much of the stuff in as possible and then sift through it. I'm like, okay, this this path should work. <laughs> Let's try this out. Hmm. But yeah, one of the big points there seems to be like, like the ability and the way in which that you receive stuff from other traditions, from other people, from other teachers. And yeah, you've received extraordinarily well with a lot of flexibility and ability to like toy with it and find your thing. Yeah, I mean, for most of the time that you've known me, it's been in a phase of uh, where the, there's starting to be that ability to trust myself and discern and integrate. Uh, but before that, there was 
agony, you know, right. I'd say for <laughs> years. So um, especially because I, I think, you know, hearing you describe about what you wanted of like, oh, you were in this really uh, formal setting that was sort of like a very rigid worldview that was imposed on you that you wanted to escape. Like, I don't know, I was actually, I was raised Unitarian Universalist. And like, that's the opposite of that, where it's like, there's a lot of good stuff out there, man. Like, check it out. Uh, yeah. And, um, and I, you know, when I, when I did, you know, there, there were steps along the way, but when I was ready to sort of walk my own spiritual path, I really reflecting on it. I think I really wanted someone to tell me what was true and how it was and what I should do. And just like, I knew, you know, I got the message from like mystical texts that like, Hey, this isn't something you can really understand or figure out. You just have to see it for yourself. And I was like, okay, like, I'm going to find someone that's trustworthy that can just tell me what to do, and then I'll do it. And, you know, that's, that is an established historical path of like having a guru that just you trust and you give your life to. And then, but for me and my nervous system and my background, it was like over time, there were just limits to my ability to do that. And in relationship with a teacher and um, I, eventually it was like, I had to step out of that and find my own, like, more of the things that you you see in me that you describe or the kinds of things that you're pointing to for the future of like hey what is my path at this time and um you know I think at this point it, it's like clear oh don't hold these things too tightly just like try them out and integrate and trust your intuition of what you're called to and like just roll up your sleeves and start somewhere like there's a lot of good stuff to do um but that that has taken agony to get to that point I'd say yeah I think that's a good like motto for a lot of people in our circles it's just like <laughs> yes before that there was agony <laughs> <laughs> totally totally yes yes well is there anything adjacent to anything that we've talked about that you'd like to dive into more or say more about um not at this moment no great that all felt really that felt complete and good too <laughs> Good. Well, thank you so much for coming on and really enjoyed this conversation and learning more about you and what you have to share with the world and curious to see where you go next, friend. For sure. All right. Farewell.